Well, I'm happy to be with you once again. This is uh, this is um, part eight of a series I've been doing on uh, a subject called Pentecostal theology. And it has the subtitle of the missing link. So part eight deals with the fact that God calls some people into ministry. To know the divine call of God is a scripturally and ordained practice by God. He did it through the scriptures, and therefore we can see and work with the people that God calls into ministry these days. It's for the purpose of leading the church. This, the church is his ordained vehicle of gathering all saints together. Now there is in one sense the priesthood of all believers. That, that everyone is called of God to lead or be involved in ministry. Um, but the truth is there's also another sense in which um, there are specific calls of God for individuals to do ministry. Well, this involves worship services, teaching, developing Timothys, planning local strategy, so really, really, we're blessed to have among us, as those that are called ministers, those with special gifts that give their lives wholeheartedly to ministry, and many full-time ministry, and many to travel great distances to preach the gospel and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let, let me suggest four things in particular that these ministers of the church do, according to the scripture. The first is the evangelization of all the world. Now here's the scripture. It's Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 20. And let me read uh, these verses for you. And Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And here's, here's the important part. The disciples therefore went everywhere and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word of God with signs following so that's that's part of the mandate or the direction that the word of God gives to those who are called with specific ministry giftings now now many leaders in the church they hear the voice of God to go to the ends of the world, and thus the Church of Jesus Christ becomes and has become international in scope. Everywhere you travel around the world, you'll find believers who are part of the Church of Jesus Christ. And so that's what's happened because of those who heard the voice of God, obeyed the voice of God, and, and went and preached the gospel and taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are, in those countries now, where the gospel has gone, there are those countries with new leaders. And they're born again, and they continue a local indigenous church ministry in the towns, the cities, the countries in which they're called. One of the things that we noticed from the book of Acts was that these disciples, they went into Judea and Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the world. And so we are following the pattern. Today, we are following the pattern that God established for ministers of the gospel. And so the first point simply is that they are to go into all the world. Now, the second reason that I find in the scripture for ministers of the gospel is found in John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I, I love the ministry of those who are called worship leaders. I think it's really important that if anyone is involved in the ministry of leading God's people in praise and worship and thanksgiving, I believe it's really important, important that they catch the mind of God in using the songs that are intended for a service. Um, I think too often we are choosing songs based on uh, maybe whether they have a lilt to them, whether that song can be used to, say, manipulate people into doing, doing what the song worship or the leader worship leader wants. But this passage speaks of uh, worshiping in spirit and in truth. And when we do that, the whole atmosphere changes for people in a service. And it's exciting to see that. So that's the second reason we have ministers of the gospel. And I think, in my mind, I think ministering in music, those are people who are ministers of the gospel. Now, the thing that is important these days is that leaders are supposed to catch a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit and lead people into the throne room of God. So when it comes for worship leaders, if they can somehow catch the breath of God, we have several old hymns used to say, one of them was, breathe on me breath of God. We have one that, a new one that the young people use a lot. But if we can catch that breath of God, that move of the Spirit, then we can bring people into that relationship with Christ and into a service that exalts the name of Jesus. Now the third pr purpose for having ministers is for building a body of believers that are conforming to the life of Christ so that every believer becomes not like necessarily the pastor, not necessarily like the minister, but that they become like Jesus. Here's one of my favorite passages of Scripture is found in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16. And God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for this reason, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so there, there, there we have it. Ministers are in place in the body of Christ to bring people to a place where they look like and mirror Jesus Christ himself. Now, now, isn't that an amazing uh, opportunity that we would have as ministers of the gospel? It's not to exalt ourselves, but it's to exalt Jesus. A couple of thoughts that come from that is that this, this, this passage of scripture is rich in, in doctrine and practicality. One of, one of my strengths in ministry has always been in practical ministry, that things that are in the word of God, sometimes a mystery, that we bring them to bear upon people's lives in the present, uh, even into our present culture. So this passage of scripture that we just read identif identifies the work of the minister in attempting to bring people into conforming their lives to look like the life of Christ, that we are mirrors of Christ. So it's rich in doctrine, and it's also rich in practicality. The second point is simply this. It shows the relationship of specific leadership callings and their limited and important roles in leading the church. So if God's called you to be a, 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 an evangelist or a teacher or a pastor, an apostle, a prophet, these, these are limited roles that you may have as an, in, as an individual. But the truth is, these are important roles that every church needs to have in existence 
in their church services and in their church body. The third point under this third point of uh, bringing people to imitate and mirror Christ is to be like Jesus is their ultimate goal. We used to sing a little chorus years ago, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask is to be like him. Powerful message in a simple chorus, and it's a shame that we don't use it more often these days. The fourth and the final point that I have with respect to uh, what ministers actually do, ministers are in place for meeting human needs with ministries of love and compassion. This is who we are as the body of Christ. This is what ministers or leaders in the body of Christ are supposed to do. We are finding ways in which to minister to people love and compassion. Both of those words are important these days. Galatians 2 and 10, this is the words of the Apostle Paul. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager, eager to do. So the Apostle Paul knew that part of his ministry as a minister was to help the poor and the needy. Keep on helping them, other saints had advised him. Again, he says in Galatians 6 and 10, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Now this becomes very specific because it's not just helping all the world and every humanitarian need. This deals with helping those that are within the body of Christ, especially to those in the family of faith, it says. The position of Jesus was that the poor will always be with us. He understood the reality of life. He understood that poverty is an unsolvable problem. And, and in our day, we, we must realize that. Not that we don't make effort in helping the poor, but that the poor will always be with us and those with problems and difficulties will always be around. The church then always needs to recognize that it's not just a matter of singing songs and going to church and Bible studies, but it's a matter of reaching out to the communities around us. But Paul said, especially remember those that are inside the household of faith. So uh, in our attempts at resolution or lessening the pain and suffering, we're involved in it but remembering that we have limited in assets and, life, and, and our ability in able to do this. It also means we have a specific obligation to those in our church community. Now here's, here's something that might be worth thinking about and maybe even worth discussing in your church or your religious community. Uh, maybe each church should have a welfare department. Now. I use these two terms, welfare department, because you would understand it. We can give it other terms. But basically, it's my belief that we should assess the needs of believers. Those that are sitting right next to us in the pews. I, I know we have to be cautious. I know that we have to respect privacy. But I believe oftentimes that there are those amongst us who are suffering needlessly. Because we, we could actually do things that would help them, even in some small ways. Sometimes it's the hydro bill that they just don't have enough to pay the full amount this month. Sometimes it's the heating bill. Sometimes it's groceries. Sometimes it's the rent. Sometimes it's even the car payment. But I believe that it's possible that we could put a uh, person or two in every church that would just go around and assessing, just asking people uh, kindly, very, you know, very discreetly. Is, is it possible that we could help you with some of your physical, financial needs to be able to bless the body of Christ? Imagine that possibility. Listen, imagine that possibility of being a soul winning mechanism within your church. Like we do lots of outreach. The church does lots of outreach. But is it possible that if we began to help those that are even amongst us, that outsiders would begin to see the power of the gospel and the interest of 
church people, most of us with, with very great resources, but the possibility of helping others so that others might want to come into the church and say, I wish I belonged to that body of believers. I wish I was part of a community like that that would actually look around them and see those in need. I've, I've thought of this as for, for months, if not years now, that it would be a powerful thing. I remember one time hearing a lawyer say to me, and he was not of our Christian faith, but he said to me, he says, Pastor MacDonald, if I was going to attend any church, I would attend your church. We had just come as a church and helped to pay a couple of months mortgage of one of our members that was overdue and they were going to lose their, their home. And here's a man outside of our faith that recognizes the Christian gospel at work. And so I believe that we would be simply fulfilling the biblical mandate of helping people. So here's four, four different ways in which the minister, the leader of the church, and we started off by saying all of us are part of the priesthood of believers, and we can have roles within the church, but then God has ordained specific people and given them gifts, special abilities, I think of them as divine abilities in being able to minister to people. And there are people in every one of our churches that could rise to the forefront if we would open doors for them. So for me, the significance of this doctrine is immeasurable. So yes, we need ministers that will give leadership to the body of Christ as a whole. So I believe every one of us could be part of that and indeed should be. We should always give honor to those who work amongst us in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God bless you, and until next time, we'll see you then.